in Leviticus chapter eight, there is a long chapter that talks about the consecration of the priesthood. That's covered in Tabernacle Shadows. Many of you have read it. And in Leviticus chapter eight, there are seven days taken to consecrate the priesthood. Now the priesthood in Leviticus represents the church that is consecrated to serve as priests for mankind in the kingdom. Now you all know the scripture in Revelation chapter 20, verse six, that says, they shall be priests of God and shall reign with him 1,000 years. That's the purpose of the millennial age, the thousand year reign of Christ, to lift mankind back to life, health, and ultimately to perfection. But to bring people back to God, that's the role of a priest. He intercedes between man and God and brings the one to the other. So the priests in Leviticus represent you and I hope myself in the occupation that we hope to share together in the kingdom to bless and redeem the whole world of mankind. Now in Leviticus 8 verse 33, we're told that this process of consecrating the priests for their service, continued for seven days. And those seven days are a picture of the gospel age that is in seven parts or seven stages. And in Revelation chapters two and three, you have two chapters detailing the experience of the church through seven periods of time in the gospel age. So when it says in Leviticus 8.33, you shall not go out of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation in seven days until the days of your consecration be at an end. Seven days shall he consecrate you. We have a picture of the consecration of all of us comprehensively the entire church through the 2000 years or so of the gospel age in seven stages. Now in Leviticus chapter eight, there were three offerings given on that day. There were bird offerings. There was a bird offering rather, a peace offering and a sin offering. Now we want to look at the meaning of those offerings just briefly. Now, when you go to Leviticus chapters one through seven, that just precedes the consecration of the priesthood in Leviticus chapter eight, there in those seven chapters, you have a breakdown of every kind of sacrifice and how to do it and what its purpose is. Now we can't look at all of those seven chapters today. That would be too much. But we just want to notice the structure of the kind of offerings that are given there. Now for this brief review, we should go back first to Exodus chapter 40. Now Exodus, of course, just precedes the book of Leviticus. And in Exodus, there are 40 chapters. You can remember that because you know that when the Israelites left Egypt at the time of the Exodus, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. That number 40 years is just a memory tool to remember that in the book of Exodus, there are 40 chapters. And it says in the first two verses of Exodus 40, Jehovah spake unto Moses saying, on the first day of the first month, 
of this second year in the wilderness, you set up the tabernacle. Now this is meaningful because a new year in the Old Testament sometimes means symbolically that we are at the beginning of a new age. So the gospel age, the period of sacrifice, when the church is consecrated to God and prepared to later serve as priests during the kingdom, this gospel age is represented as beginning in Exodus on a brand new year, as though to say we are now in a brand new age in God's plan. And that's a good fundamental point about the consecration of the church. It was not going on from the time of Adam forward, but only from the time of Jesus forward. Before that time, you had the calling of the ancient worthy class. But now, from the time of the gospel age, in this new age, we have the calling of the church, a new development in God's plan. Now in Leviticus chapter one through seven, this immediately follows Exodus chapter 40 for a very good reason. In Exodus chapter 40, Moses is told now at the beginning of this new year, representing the new age, the gospel age in God's plan. Now put all of the pieces of the tabernacle together and begin the operation of the tabernacle. Now you can read Exodus chapter 40 and it tells you how Moses reared the tabernacle and put all the pieces together. Even he set up the court. Now, of course, Moses had help, but Moses directed this activity. But finally, when you reach the end of the 40th chapter, there is something missing. The tabernacle is all ready, but you don't have any priests to serve. So you turn the page from Exodus 40, and now you get into the book of Leviticus, which is all about the Levites and the priesthood. And for seven chapters in Leviticus, you have an explanation of the kind of sacrifices that the priesthood is going to be making. And when you're finished with those seven chapters, finally you get to chapter eight, and now it's time to use those offerings to consecrate the priests for their service. So Exodus chapter 40, when they constructed the tabernacle, and Leviticus chapter 8, when they began to consecrate the priests, all happened on the very same day. The first day of the first month of the second year in the wilderness, showing that the consecration of the priesthood, the consecration of you as believers in Christ, and I hope myself, as part of this church, through the gospel age is the first step to prepare for the kingdom to bless the world of mankind later. Now, these are the offerings, sin offering, bird offering, and peace offering that Leviticus chapter eight tells us we must have in order to begin our consecration. So what do these offerings mean? Now, if you look in Leviticus chapter one through seven, you will see that the first offering mentioned in Leviticus is the burnt offering. And the burnt offering in chapter one is makes atonement. That's the purpose of a burnt offering. Now you'll see that in Leviticus one, verse three and verse four. At the end of verse four, it says, the burnt offering shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Now, when we hear atonement, we think of the sacrifice of Jesus given for our redemption. 
And that is the proper connection to make. So first we have to be redeemed. That's the burnt offering. And then, then we have the privilege of giving our life in consecration to God once we have been redeemed and justified. And a peace offering represents our consecration to God. So that comes in Leviticus after the burnt offering. And then in chapter four of Leviticus comes a sin offering. A sin offering is given to purge sin from a believer. So first we are consecrated to God based upon the redemption we have in Jesus. That's why a burnt offering is mentioned first. First we're redeemed, then we consecrate our lives to God, and then during our life we are purged from sin, prepared to be after Christ, a priesthood that can serve God faithfully in the kingdom. Now, when you go to Leviticus chapter eight, you find the same three offerings, but they're in a different order. Why does Leviticus chapter 8 give a different sequence? Because Leviticus chapter 8 tells us the sequence in which these things actually occurred in the gospel age fulfillment. First, Jesus began to be an offering for sin starting at river at the river Jordan when he was consecrated to become our high priest during the gospel age. For three and a half years, Jesus suffered until finally his death on Calvary's cross. To prepare him to be our high priest to purge us from the propensity of sin. And then at the end of his service, he died on Calvary's cross as our burnt offering to provide atonement for us. And then on the day of Pentecost, the church was received, redeemed, and invited to give their consecration to God. And that is represented by the peace offering. Now the peace offering is called a peace offering, not because it brings peace, but because it is founded on the fact that we have peace with God. So Jesus for three and a half years was our sin offering. He died to give us redemption. And then having peace with God, we can now present our bodies in consecrated service to God as peace offerings. Okay, going to go to the next slide. Should we consecrate? Now, I think that in some minds, that's an obvious question. Yes, we should. We should take advantage to devote ourselves to God completely. And that is a good answer. But of course, consecration depends upon the fact that our hearts are in harmony with God first. Now we have a scripture, Proverbs 23, seven, that addresses this. As a, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So the question, should we consecrate, depends upon what is in our heart. If our heart is inclined toward God, toward righteousness, if we recognize there's a privilege of service now and service in the kingdom to help others come back to God. And if our heart says we would like to be part of that, part of God's program, part of this class to help bless the world of mankind. If we appreciate what Jesus did for us, if we're willing like his disciples to even suffer with Christ, that we might reign with him, then we should proceed to give our life in consecration. 
Now, most of you listening here today have already done this. Some of you perhaps not, but this is a remarkable privilege, a remarkable opportunity to devote ourselves to the Heavenly Father in full consecration. And if our heart is inclined toward God, we should not hesitate. Now you have the example in Acts chapter 10 of Cornelius, the first Gentile convert. And when finally Peter was sent to open to Cornelius the privilege of the high calling, Cornelius did not hesitate. Immediately when he heard the words of Peter, while he was, Peter was yet speaking, the influence of the Holy Spirit came upon the group and Peter recognized from this and those that were with Peter that God was now accepting Gentiles into the faith. And so Peter said, what prevents these people from being baptized? And so Cornelius and his household, all of faith, were baptized that very day. Now you have another example of something very similar. This is in Acts chapter 16, verse 33 and 34. This is the Philippian jailer. He was a man who must have been of some faith already because when Paul and Silas were prisoners in his jail and they had been beaten and it, they were singing hymns even till midnight, something about those hymns responded in his mind. It must have been a man of faith for that response to take place. And then at midnight, there was an earthquake. The jail was broken apart. The jailer feared that all of the captives might have escaped. He was ready to take his life in despair. And Paul called out, no, don't do that. We're all here. And the jailer, came in trembling, fell before Paul, and he didn't know what to do, but he knew he could do something good for Paul and Silas, the men of God. So he took them back to his home. He tended their wounds. He listened to their message. And that very night, Paul and Silas baptized the jailer and his household, apparently a household of faith that now was introduced to the message of redemption. What I take from these instances is that if you have a heart towards God, do not hesitate, arise and be baptized. The next instance of course is at Pentecost itself. That's in Acts the second chapter, verse 41. 3000 people on the day of Pentecost who heard the message of Peter and the other disciples and knew about the resurrection of Jesus, immediately took the opportunity to be baptized. Now this number, 3000, I presume was the largest number of baptisms on one day that there ever was, I presume. And that number reminds us of something that back in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, when the law covenant was instituted for Israel, right after that, when they were all committed, Moses went back to the mountain for 40 days. He came down and he heard the people in riot and they had built a golden calf and were worshiping it. And 3000 people died as a consequence on that very day. And I think the point is, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, verse six, the letter of the law kills because no one can abide by the letter of the law perfectly, but the spirit of the law gives life. We're no longer under the letter that was unto death. 3,000 people died that day. But now 3,000 people come to spiritual life and are baptized on the day of Pentecost when the spirit of the law finally comes to us.
So even that number, I think, is meaningful. Why three? Why not 4,000? Because three is the number in, in the Bible that deals with redemption and atonement. You know that Jesus was three days in the grave. You remember that he was sold for 30 pieces of silver. You remember when he was anointed for his death by Mary, it was 300 pence of ointment. And finally, on the day of Pentecost, when the brethren are redeemed by the blood of Jesus, 3,000 believed into Jesus. Three, redemption, because there is man, there is God above, and there is Jesus, our Redeemer, between. Three parties to the redemption. Now, in Luke, the 14th chapter, Jesus gives us advice about consecration. The examples we've used so far show us we should be prompt in our devotion, in our dedication. And once prompt, we should be faithful on the follow through. Now we're going to have pitfalls. We're going to have difficulties and problems. We're even going to have sin because our purging from sin and the propensity of sin will never fully extirpate sin from us. We're going to have weaknesses. So we should be earnest, devoted, prompt, but we will have pitfalls. So Jesus said in Luke, the 14th chapter, sit down and count the cost. Now, this is the other side of considering the issue of consecration. Sometimes we speak of a coin with two sides. On the one side, your urge to promptness, once you see the privileges that consecration will bring, we should enter in promptly. But on the other side, Jesus says, not so prompt that you don't consider that this will be a lifetime of cost, of sacrifice, and of suffering. Now, we don't suffer every day. Jesus didn't suffer every day. But there will be suffering involved. So we sit down and count the cost. Just like a person ready to build a tower will sit down and count the cost whether he have sufficient to complete the tower. So we should think as we prepare our life of consecration, are we ready for a lifetime of commitment, for a 100% commitment to the goal of our consecrated life, to serve and please and honor our Heavenly Father, to accept the principles of godliness? Well, I think, I think we are. We will slip but we should have that determination. Yes, we are ready. And if we've counted the cost and we realize we're ready for a life of commitment, then let us proceed. Now, the last item here on this list of six bulleted items is something very sweet. It's honey. And this is part of our consecrated life. It's not all suffering and difficulty. It's pleasant, sweet honey in the sense that we know we are doing the will of our father which is in heaven and we can have peace and the sweet content of life and the assurance that we are doing the right thing now way back in the old testament in exodus the 16th chapter verse 31 this symbol of honey first comes to our attention this was the time when the Israelites were in the wilderness and they needed food desperately. And God provided something miraculously for them, something they had never seen before. Exodus 16, 31. The house of Israel called the name of this new food manna. And it was like coriander seed, white. And the taste of it, oh, very nice like wafers made with honey. Now the word manna itself means, what is it? You'll see that in the margin of the text when they found the manna, they didn't know what it was. So they called it a name that says, what is it? This is something they had never seen before. 
And before the gospel age opened, we had never seen the richness of the calling to be of spirit life. Even the disciples at the Last Supper did not really understand what Jesus was offering them. You know, not long before that, they had said, in Luke, the 19th chapter, they expected the kingdom to shortly appear. And Jesus sat down and gave them a parable and said, no, it's like the, the man who went to a far country to receive a kingdom and later to return. And Jesus gave them this parable because they thought the kingdom would immediately appear. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem as a conquering king, he was received with shouts of Hosanna. They thought, surely he's going to become king. But Jesus knew it would be a long time away. And even at the Last Supper, he said, I'm going away. But if I go away, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I'll come back and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, still, they didn't really understand. That was in John, the 14th chapter. And then as they left the upper room in John 17, Jesus gave a prayer to God for his disciples. And he prayed that they may be with me where I am so that we can be together in heavenly glory. The apostles still didn't fully understand. But after Jesus was raised, after he visited them on and off for parts of 40 days, then they knew. Then they realized that Jesus, a spirit being now, were going to join him as spirit beings as well. And this sweet, blessed opportunity is like wafers made with honey. That's that manna. Now you remember that back in Leviticus chapter 8, in the consecration of the priesthood, they waved to God three things. They waved unleavened bread, showing the sinlessness of our justification. They waved oiled bread, showing that we're going to be justified and consecrated to God through the Holy Spirit, the oil of the Holy Spirit. And they waved a wafer before God, showing that we have the hope of our high calling of God in Christ Jesus for spiritual glory. That's what the wafer means. Now you'll see that in Tabernacle Shadows, that that's the meaning of the wafer. So here, this manna is wafers made with honey. This is the sweet hope of the high calling of glory with Christ in heaven, beyond, in the next age. Now you see other scriptures here. Numbers, the 11th chapter, verses 6 and 8. This is later on in Israel's experience. It's also about the manna. And it says that after some time, the Israelites grew weary of this manna. Number 6, uh, excuse me, 11. Verse six, now is our soul dried and there is nothing but this manna before our eyes. And then they describe this manna again in verse eight. It says the taste of it was like the taste of fresh oil. Well, now oil is okay, but it, you see they lost the concept of the sweet taste of honey. That can happen to us we may realize that day after day after day in our consecrated life seems mundane. And maybe our spiritual nourishment, the word of truth and our prayer life and our fellowship with brethren, maybe it can grow old to us and commonplace. Then we might still recognize it as the oil of the Holy Spirit but we may lose the remembrance of that honey sweet taste. But remember, it is honey. It's our, the sweetness of our heavenly calling that we will share with Christ beyond the veil. Now we won't have time to look at these other scriptures, but that's where honey comes into play in Samson's experience. Samson was a picture of the church 
in his weaknesses and in his strength. And you remember the riddle he put it forward? Out of the eater came forth meat, out of the strong came forth sweetness. That was all about the honey of the high calling for the church. Jonathan dipped his staff in the honey and his eyes were lightened as the first understanding of the high calling is illustrated there. But we'll go on. We're gonna go on now to what is expected of us if we do consecrate. And the first thing that is expected of us, it says in 1 Thessalonians 4.3, is sanctification. This is the will of God for each one of us even your sanctification. Now, that expression is very common. We all know we are to be sanctified in Christ Jesus. But what does that word mean? Now, you have heard perhaps that this means to be set apart for God's special service. Well, that's good. That's technically a good meaning. But if you notice the last part of 1 Thessalonians 4.3, he tells you what he has in mind in this word. And that is that you should abstain from fornication. Each one of you know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. The point of sanctification is moral holiness. And you remember, we must be holy. Without holiness, we cannot see God. So the first thing expected of us in our Christian life is to be holy, sanctified, pure, putting away the things of the flesh that are indecent, immoral, and improper. That's number one. We have to have a standard of what is right, pure, decent, and good. But that's not adequate. That's good, but not sufficient. We must go on then to develop the graces of Christian character. And the first of those is love. In Luke 6, verse 35, love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and you shall be children of the highest, for he is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. Be therefore merciful as your father is merciful. This should be the background mode of our mind, always with love, care, compassion, mercy, tenderness. Now I'll tell you, I was last year in the hospital very briefly. And when I left the hospital, one thing I remembered of all of those dear people, and that was the kindness that was shown to me. In fellowship before this meeting, I spoke to a sister from India. I spoke to a brother from Africa. And what I remembered of the experiences in those places was the kindness that was shown to me in visiting the brethren. Kindness sticks with you. You always remember the kindness you have received. And kindness, love, should be what we exude and show and exhibit to others, especially to others that are called of the household of faith. Always remember kindness. Next. In Luke, the 19th chapter, service. You remember this is the parable of the pounds. In this parable, a master gave one pound to each one of his servants. And then he says, do something with this value of money. And then he left and he returned after a long time. And he saw that one servant had increased his 10 times. Another had increased his five times. But the third servant, had not increased it, merely preserved it. And that one pound was removed from him and given to the 10 pound person. The others were richly rewarded. The lesson here Jesus wants us to know is that we must do something of service to the heavenly father and to Jesus in our cause. Next, as the time advances so quickly, we must develop the fruits of the spirit and the graces of the spirit. Now we'll talk about that in just a moment, but I want to distinguish between fruits and graces. In Galatians 5, 22 and 23, 
we have the fruit of the Spirit enumerated in nine categories. And then in 2 Peter, there are things that we add to our faith. We had virtue and knowledge and temperance. And because those are another category of things, sometimes brethren refer to them as the graces of the Spirit because they've already identified the fruits in Galatians. That's where we have the expression, the fruits and graces of the Spirit. So let's look at those. I'd like to look at them in great detail, but our time is evaporating. In the fruits of the Spirit, you start off with the one Jesus highlighted first, love, joy, peace. Now, I remember those three. Somehow those are easy to remember. I try to remember all of these. I try to memorize them. And then now and then I forget them. I go back and try to memorize them again. Love, joy, peace. And the next three I remember because they're longer. Long suffering. Gentleness. That's like kindness. That's really what that word means. Goodness. Faith, meekness, and temperance. Now I've highlighted temperance and I've highlighted love because we see both of those in the second list as well. In 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7, add to your faith virtue. Now that's moral, moral virtue. That's like 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. We must be sanctified. We must be morally pure and clean. That's virtue. Add again knowledge. That's a deeper knowledge of the truth and the understanding of godliness. Thirdly, temperance. That means self-control. Now you see that that's in both lists. And the reason we highlight that is because self-control is one of the most difficult things for a Christian to achieve. Patience, godliness, and then two forms of love, brotherly love and unselfish love, agape. So you have love at the first here, the end here, temperance at the end here, in the middle here. And now we must summarize and conclude. Dear brethren, there is no privilege higher ever to be extended than the privilege of consecration to the Heavenly Father during this time. There will come a time when everyone will appreciate the principles of godliness. But now we have the privilege of giving our little all in consecration, being devoted to God, suffering a little with our master, that we might be developed in these fruits of the spirit and be used by him to lift every man, woman, and child who has ever lived out of sin to the likeness of God. God be with you all as you walk your consecrated life. Thank you.